we are in a sermon series entitled Hell, Let's Talk About It. And uh, we do have some notes that are going to be handed out. If you'd like a copy, just let these guys know so we can make sure that you guys get a copy. Now, a lot of times, I realize this is a weird subject. Even in church, to talk, we're going to talk for weeks about hell. We're going to talk for a few weeks about it. And, and, and in 2015 Pew Research poll, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of people were polled and asked if they believe in hell. And 34% of them said they did not believe in hell. That's something that we've seen rise as, as times go on. I understand hell is a scary idea. Uh, in fact, I wish that hell didn't exist personally. That would make uh, my life for my unsaved friends much easier. But in light of what Jesus talked about and taught in his teaching, hell is a very real thing, a very real place. And sadly, Jesus tells us it's a place that many people are going to go to. In fact, let's listen to some of his words. These are the words of Jesus in Matthew 7. Wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life. And only a few find it. Jesus' words are words of truth. Jesus spoke the truth, the whole truth, didn't he? And he declares the truth on this subject. And those very sobering words for all of us. And all of all the people in Scripture that talk about hell, Jesus is at the top of the list. He talks more about hell than anybody else. And so this is something that we need to learn about. We need to understand it fully. And the imagery that Jesus uses, it's scary stuff. I mean, he talks about fire and darkness and eternal punishment, he calls it. He warns us. He warns us to avoid this place. And so even though hell isn't something we like to talk about, not necessarily an enjoyable subject, it is something we need to discuss. We need to do everything we can to avoid it and understand how that's possible. When you talk about hell, inevitably, there are certain questions that regularly come up. We're going to look at three of the top questions today that, that do come up in conversation. Here's the first one. Why would a good and loving God make an awful place like hell? I've heard this question asked myself. It's, it's an honest question. I think it's a good question. So let's see what the Bible has to say. If you have your Bibles... Open them with me to Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to go to Jesus' teaching and uh, see some things here. He's talking about a different area uh, specifically, different context, but, but he answers this question for us. Uh, if you have a smartphone, feel free to open up your Bible app, and you can follow along with us there too. Matthew 25, and uh, we'll begin with verse 31 through 32. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. And so this is a future judgment for those who are alive at the end of the tribulation period. We talked about this earlier in the year, the seven-year tribulation. These are those who live through it, and when Jesus comes at a second coming, he will judge the living. That's what this is, the context here is. Uh, look at verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, that would be the goats, the, those he calls the goats, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And so we see here that a good and loving God made a place of hell for who? Originally for the devil and other fallen angels. Now let's, let's camp out here for just a little bit, this idea of the devil. The devil is a word that we use a lot. In the original language, the Greek language it was used in, it means false accuser or slanderer. Satan is another name we give the devil. In Hebrew, it means adversary. But when you go way back to the, where the Bible talks about the origins, so to speak, the first accounts we hear of the devil or Satan, he's referred to by another name, and that name is Lucifer. Lucifer is pronounced Hillel in Hebrew, and it means 
shining one or son of the morning. Not the way we think of Satan, but it's the way he was named because he was an angel of light. He was a heavenly being. That's what originally how God made him. But just like we have a free will, so do the angels. The Bible teaches us that one day that Lucifer was filled with pride. Uh, varying people will teach varying reasons. Some say he was a worship angel, and he was among the most beautiful of angels. And so he was filled with pride to the degree that he began to think he should be worshipped alongside God. And that's obviously a no-no. In fact, Isaiah 14 describes this. It says, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise up my throne above the stars of God. Stars is another word for angels, the bright ones, the shining ones. It says, I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. Elsewhere in scripture, heaven is referred to, often the throne of God is referred to as on a sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Lucifer wanted to be like God. And the result was his fall. Uh, by the way, does that sound at all familiar? Of course it does. We read a very similar story to this in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, the serpent, who Revelation tells us is the devil comes to Eve in the Garden of Eden, and in Genesis 3, 5, Eve's told, if you eat the forbidden fruit, quote, you will be like God. Very similar to the same temptation he experienced. Adam followed her lead, and the result, as Satan fell, humanity also fell. Satan isn't the only hev heavenly being that rebelled against God. We know that because Revelation 12 shares that many others did as well. It says that a third of the angels joined Lucifer and were cast down. Let's look at just a few select passage, verses of this passage. It says, another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Now, the context of this passage is not the original rebellion of Lucifer. It's different. The context is different. We don't have the time to get into it. It would take us a whole different direction of study. But the point I'm trying to make here is that Satan, as well as at least a third of other angels that were in heaven, at some point were cast down to earth. And with it, they formulated their own mission, their own purpose. What is their mission? Nearly 400 years ago in Scotland, a group of Puritan preachers and elders gathered together, and they came up or produced what we know as the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Now, that's not something in a Baptist tradition that we use. It's something we probably should seriously consider using because there's great impact and blessing that comes from it. But uh, basically what it is, it's a series of questions and answers that you are shared over and over and over from the time you're a kid up into your adult years, and they teach you basic Christian doctrine. At the very beginning of the document, it is shared that the chief ends of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. It's a great statement. It's a very biblical statement. The chief ends of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We see this in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all. Everybody say, do all. Do all to the glory of God. That pretty much encompasses everything, doesn't it? Then in Psalm chapter 34, verse 7, we read, delight yourself in the Lord. So we see that Scripture affirms this idea. God created us to glorify Him and to delight or enjoy Him. And when we fell there in the garden, God sent a Redeemer, someone who could bring new life to us. We were recreated spiritually so that we could once again glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So what do you think, in light of this, what do you think Satan and these fallen angels are about doing? The exact opposite of glorifying God and enjoying Him. 
In fact, they want to do everything they can so that the rest of God's creation doesn't glorify God and enjoy him forever. So God, who deserves all glory and all praise and all honor, Satan wants to steal it. He wants that glory deflected elsewhere. It's the one thing he can take from God. Satan is incredibly smart, smarter than any of us. He can't win against God. And so he chooses, he and the fallen angels, to come together, unify, and distract, to deflect the glory that belongs to God so that he doesn't get it. The one thing he can take that God can never get back. Genesis 1 says that we, humanity, was made in the image of God. We were, we were created to reflect God's glory. Satan enters, he tempts, so that that image would be marred scarred and scratched so that it would affect our reflective ability, you could say. And Satan and his minions work as false accusers, as, as slanderers, as, 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 as adversaries trying to get us, trying to get God's image bearers to not reflect God's glory the way he desired, to instead deflect it, to divert it anywhere, focus it anywhere but so that God doesn't receive it. I wonder, just look at our lives real quick. Let's do a, a little accounting here. Look at your life. Look at your work. Look at your play. Look at your family time, your worship. Are you a reflector or are you a deflector of God's glory? Do you shine and show Christ, show the goodness of God in what you do and what you say? Or you do, do you deflect? Are you, a, are you a reflector or are you a deflector of God's glory? So with all of this, we're finding the answer to our first question. Why would a God, a loving, good God, make an awful place like hell? It was for the devil. It was for fallen angels. Jesus says that, Matthew 25. But then we humans ended up buying into the same lie that Satan did. We wanted to be like God, and so we exchanged the truth we had for a lie. We exchanged the life we had for death. We exchanged light for darkness. And now when you look over the world, you don't have to look hard before you find those very things that we wanted. So the destination for fallen angels has now become the destination for fallen men as well. Which brings us to the next question. Why would a good and loving God send anyone to hell? I mean, after all, he's good, right? He's loving. C.S. Lewis, in his uh, classic work, The Great Divorce, suggests just a different way of looking at this issue. He suggests that God doesn't actually send people to hell. He just respects their free will. Follow this with me for just a second. I think it's an interesting way to look at it. Uh, to choose heaven is to choose Jesus. That's his abode. That's where he is at the right hand of God the Father. It, to choose heaven is to choose Jesus, where he is, the way he is, uh, coming under his authority because he is the Lord. At the end of the great divorce, C.S. Lewis says, there are two kinds of people, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those whom God says, thy will be done. My point is, is that in the end, all who are in hell, sadly, have chosen to be there. They rejected God. They didn't want to reflect his glory. They rejected his means of escape. Jesus. God gives all of us a free will. He never forces us to choose him. He makes every opportunity for us to know him and choose him, but he never forces the issue. And so to go to hell is to reject him and his escape plan. It's to choose in many ways to go there. Now, this doesn't mean in any way that, that God revels in people who choose, don't choose him. God is never happy in fact, we see in Ezekiel 18, 23, the words of God, do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Would I not rather they turn from their wicked ways and live? And of course, the answer is, of course, yes. Jesus speaks regarding hypocritical religious leaders in Jerusalem. 
When he addresses the city and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. It's a protection. It's a guarding. It's being close to the one who cares and loves and looks after your best interests. And then Jesus says, you were not willing. I long for this. You're not willing. God's not going to force people to choose him. We must choose. God's not going to do it for us. And when we don't choose Christ, we choose hell. That's not what he wants. Even, even 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, you, you, we've shared this a lot this year. It says it's not God's will that anyone perish. He, he longs for us to repent, to turn from our sin to him so that we would know life. Which brings us to the last question that we'll spend the most of our time on today. Why doesn't God just forgive people? I mean, he's God. He's all powerful. Why doesn't he just blanket forgive everybody? A lot of people ask that question. In fact, a lot of us, even all of us in this room, are counting on God's forgiveness, right? That's how we're getting there. We're thankful that God is a forgiving God. We rest in his forgiveness. Okay, then why doesn't he just forgive everybody? We really do need to talk about this. Many assume that because God is all-powerful, he can do anything, and he is all-powerful. But there are lots of things he cannot do. His holy nature prevents him from doing things. For example, lying. The Bible tells us God cannot lie. Uh, He cannot compromise his holy nature, which means that he can't be indifferent to sin. He has to deal with it. His nature requires him. He is holy. He is the righteous, just judge of the universe. His nature demands that he deal with all sin. He's a God of justice. Praise him for that. Praise him. I think the best way to deal with this and really is to paint a real picture of it. On February 24th, 2005, this beautiful little girl was reported missing from her home in Homosassa, Florida. Her name is Jessica Lunsford. Three weeks after the reported missing, the police discovered that she, was, she had been kidnapped and brutally raped and then buried alive. She was found tied up in a kneeling position, clutching a stuffed toy. She was nine years old, abducted, raped, and buried alive with her stuffed toy. I hesitated to even do this, but it, it, it pushes the point. This Next slide is the scum that did this. How do you feel about that man? Does he make you angry? God is outraged at him. God is so holy and so just, he will punish this man fully. But God must also punish all wrong. He is so holy and so just, his nature requires that of him. See, God doesn't limit his outrage just to rapists, people who abduct others and murderers. Nothing is hidden from the all-seeing holiness of God. Not lying, not thieving, even when it's small, not sexual immorality, even when we do it in the name of love. He sees it all, and he sees every unseen secret that we hold in our motives. He sees our hidden sin, even Jesus. He declares to us in Matthew chapter 12, he says, but I say to you that every idle word that man shall speak shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Nothing gets past God. He's that pure. He's that holy. He's that just. 
and his nature requires him to deal with it. It just has to be this way. It's the nature of God. Remember how we're created in the image of God? We were made to reflect his goodness, his glory, but instead we chose sin. We chose to reject God, reject his ways. We, instead of being used of him, reflection of him, we chose to sin against him, against his nature. And that requires punishment. God isn't just holy. There are four living creatures that are around the throne, and they declare night and day, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. He is so perfect, so pure, so just, but he's also so loving and so compassionate. And so he found a way A holy God with a holy nature found a way to pardon that didn't compromise his holiness. A pardon that would come at a huge cost to him. God's only begotten sinless son, Jesus, was willing to take on all of our sins punishment on himself so that we wouldn't have to. Martin Luther calls this the great exchange. What a great name for it. Sin goes on the perfect Jesus for for our punishment, and his righteousness comes on the sinner. It's a supernatural swap, and it's brilliant because it allows him to save sinners without compromising his justice. Justice is still served. It just all goes on to Jesus. So God has this plan to pardon sinners. But let's remember who the sinners are. There are more than just humans, right? First, we looked at earlier, Lucifer is a sinner. He rebelled. He rejected God. And then, of course, we have each of the fallen angels that also were cast out of heaven. Then we have Adam. But then we also have all of the descendants of Adam. You could include Eve with Adam because Eve came from Adam. And then you have all of the descendants of Adam, which would be us. But here's the thing. This this pardon, it is only possible because of the one and only sinless begotten Son of God, which means that only one of these can receive the pardon. See, angels are not related. They're individual creations. So God could have used this pardon offered by Jesus and put it on Lucifer, and he would have been forgiven. But then he would have been done. Or he could have put it on one of the many angels, but only one could be saved. But Adam was different. Adam and all of his descendants were related. In fact, all of us humans, we have the blood of Adam in us. We wouldn't exist apart from him. And that makes us very unique than the angels. And so God chose to use that pardon for Adam, which in turn allowed the possibility for all of his descendants who carry his blood to be pardoned as well. It was a very interesting and unique plan. So God chooses, and he chooses Adam because it allows not only him, but potentially his descendants to be pardoned as well. Jesus trades his life for Adam. He who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin for Adam and in doing so for us as well. And Jesus' righteousness could then be given to us. And because we have Adam's blood, we can be pardoned. But it's conditional. We must turn from our sin and trust in him. Who he is. What Jesus did for us on the cross, taking the punishment of our sin. We must trust him with our lives. 
in providing this pardon, we see God's holiness, his holy requirement is met because sin is punished. Jesus takes the punishment. But also we see the love and compassion of God for us. See, God cannot just forgive everybody. It goes against his nature. Sin has to be dealt with. Jesus deals with it by taking it on himself, allowing forgiveness to be given to us. And so we read in the Bible, now is the time of God. Now is the day of salvation. See, forgiveness is available. If you're a human, forgiveness is available. We don't have to go to hell, although we deserve it because we've sinned, we've rebelled, we've rejected God, we want to do life our way, we like to fudge everything so it fits our desires, right? We've done it in thought, we've done it in word, we've done it in deed, but in his love and grace, he's provided us an escape from the path to hell so that we can spend eternity with him in his joy but we have to accept it. We have to accept and trust in Christ with our lives. Have you done that? Those of you who are watching from home, have you done that? Put your faith and trust, your life trust in Jesus Christ? If not, do it today. Do it this morning. Pray to him. Acknowledge your sin. Accept this grace that he's given. Accept his forgiveness. And then begin being who he made you, he recreates us spiritually speaking so that we can once again reflect his glory as image bearers of God, reflecting his goodness, his light, his love, sharing his truth everywhere we go and in everything we do. See, hell isn't something people want to talk about. They don't even want to think about hell. It is scary. It's disturbing. It can be downright depressing. The thought of us or our friends or family going there, experiencing hell, troubling. But Jesus talked about it more than anybody else. And he offered us a way to escape it. Francis Chan says in his book, Erasing Hell, we need to stop explaining away hell and start proclaiming his solution to it, God's solution. Those of you who are sitting in this room, Those of you who are watching, maybe sitting in your living room, where are you spiritually? Have you put your faith and trust in the only way to escape hell, in Jesus Christ? Are you a God reflector or a deflector? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus? If not, do it today. Today is the day of salvation, Jesus. Don't leave here. Don't turn off that video until you get this thing taken care of. And if you're ready, you can take care of it right now. Let's bow together. We bow just to close off the distractions. We also enter into a posture of prayer. If you're ready, trust your life to Jesus Christ. Then you can pray with me. Just say, Jesus, I I know I'm a sinner. I want my life my way. I need your pardon. In love, you came to save me from going to hell. You gave your life to secure that way from hell. I give my life to you. In your death and resurrection, you desire to make me new. I accept it. Restore me to my former self as a reflective, a reflector of God's glory. I don't understand it all. I don't have it all figured out. But the best I can and know, I want to glorify and and enjoy you forever. From now on, in Jesus' name I pray. Every head still bowed. Maybe you have a friend or a family member. Maybe you're, you're concerned about where they're going to spend eternity. Pray right now that God the Father would draw them to Jesus. The Bible says, Jesus says, only God the Father can draw people to Christ. Pray that he would. Mention their name in prayer. 
pray that God would use you to share that there is an escape from hell. Share with them the hope of Jesus that you found. If Jesus was willing to talk about it and lovingly warn people, how can we not do the same? Father, we invite you right now as the lead shepherd of this flock, Lord, I invite you right now to just allow your spirit to invade us with your feelings, your heart, Lord, on this issue. Lord, help us, equip us. May we seek after that equipping so that we might share the only hope there is now, the person of Jesus Christ, and that we might love enough to share that with others. Your will be done, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.